Okay, so what I want to say has nothing to do with the... What you're not doing. You have it already. Yesterday was faculty day, and uh, I would like, first of all, to thank all the students who participated in uh, helping in, in, in the organization and helping. And we had a poster competition. One of, our, of the posters of uh, the ICNC, the poster for Galita Gumon, got the faculty prize, the third, third uh, prize of the faculty. By the way, the other third prize of the faculty was given to a student from uh, uh, Micha uh, uh, Spirala, uh, Avial Chai. And uh, we had also our own uh, poster competition, and the winner of our competition was the runner-up among all the posters of the, of the ICNC is uh, uh, was the poster of Gidon Rothschild. So I would like to give Gidon his prize, his ICNC poster prize. Gidon. <laughs> and uh, I would like you to see even more posters and better next year. Oh, by the way, the judge was uh, Daphna Baichal, so anyone who did not win the poster can <laughs> 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 go to her. Okay, thank you. So no more announcements, then it's a special pleasure for me to present our today's lecturer. Professor Bill Jacobs from Berkeley, California, who was my host last year when I went on sabbatical. And I know people say that women are multitasking, but I looked at Bill's CV, and he is a psychologist, MD, neurologist, psychiatric specialist, and a very successful researcher. I could only be envious when he told me now that he won the Obama grant that he was writing last year when I was there. And maybe the president will hear that. <laughs> okay. So uh, his special interest is in uh, brain imaging, specifically uh, imaging of amyloid plaques which is a technology that is not yet performed in Israel at all. And I tried to understand a little bit about that last year. Learned very little, I'm afraid. But we are continuing to collaborate. So right now we are in the midst of a Skype writing of a paper combining biochemistry and Skype brain imaging, which will be a first <coughs> in some kind. And I was really impressed to see how Bill graciously <coughs> navigates between these different responsibilities, including administration, which is a, a real pain, I can tell you. So it's wonderful that we could convince you to come here. And Bill will also lecture in our uh, new course on neurodegenerative disease, Sebastian Cardinals and I. And uh, that would be Monday, 2 to 4 p.m. in this room. If there will be some space left, you are all invited. Yes. <coughs> oh, I forgot the most important thing. We have a oh very my. new plaque of the Eric Holland Forum of Neurodegenerative Disease. And you are the very first oh, thank you. awardee of that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Mona. Um, it, was, uh, it was an amazing experience to have Mona in my lab for six, uh, six months. Uh, she, ke you know, I, I, she thinks that, that I multitask, but she managed to do, you know, to do so much in the lab. She, we actually, I've had many people Travel through my lab for that period of time and never got a paper out of it. You know, uh, <laughs> we've got a paper, and I learned just learned a new verb today of Skype writing, which is 
which is pre pretty, uh, pretty uh, apropos. So um, we had a wonderful experience, and I'm just very glad to be invited here to speak to you and um, tell you about some of the work we've been doing. Um, I could introduce this in so many ways, but let me say two things about this talk. First of all, it's a pretty much a new talk. So this is the version 1.0. Uh, and uh, we'll see how it goes. The reason I did this is because I wasn't sure what to talk to um, this audience about. And um, when you're trying to, um, uh, you know, I know it's a very broad group and probably no one in the group does much of what I do. So a lot of the talk or a bit of the talk is methods and I hope those of you who are familiar with the methods won't be insulted if I, if I uh, spend too much time on them. And uh, I just want to make sure you get how we do this. Uh, and then uh, some of it may not be at the level you're familiar with, either hopefully not too low, hopefully not too high, but just right. But I might have hit it wrong, so I apologize for that. But the bottom line is that what I'm doing today is talking about, I don't know, well, let me put it this way, I don't know about you, but to me the best projects in my lab are always the ones that aren't published yet. That's because they haven't seen the harsh light of the reviewer's eyes, probably because it's just what I'm most excited about. So I'm going to tell you about a bunch of things that are going on in the lab that, uh, that represent two large projects in the brain that um, are largely not yet published and still um, under development. So I'd be very glad to hear your feedback and thoughts and comments. So uh, my lab is involved both in the study of patients with dementia and in the study of patients with aging. And in some respects, we consider ourselves doing cognitive aging. And Probably the biggest uh, factor that, expo that, that people talk about in cognitive aging is, is not simply decline, which you see here, but it's variability, variance. So as people get older, there's much more variance in the way they perform on cognitive tests and all kinds of things that you measure. And, and at any given age, there's often people with measurements that replicate those of people in their 20s or 30s, and then much wider ranges of what is quote unquote normal for age. Now, the idea of cognitive aging has a long history and uh, goes back certainly uh, a dec more than decades, but one of the very influential ideas that began this process that all cognitive, that in addition to people aging differently, this, this idea came along that, that, that pointed out that not all cognitive processes changed the same way. So this model that was developed largely by uh, John Horn uh, broke um, cognitive functions into two very gross categories, one of crystallized intelligence and the other fluid intelligence. So fluid intelligence were things like memory and problem solving, and crystallized intelligence were things like language, social inter intelligence and social interaction and so forth. And it was very clear that if you measured these things, you found that older people didn't necessarily decline on this crystallized intelligence, but tended to more decline in this fluid intelligence. So that's, that's sort of an idea that started this trend that all things don't change the same way as we get older. But it's really become much more obvious as people have dissected cognitive function using a whole bunch of different kinds of cognitive approaches. And this is a, a study that was done by <coughs> the group at Rush, Bob Wilson, who basically, I, I know you can't read this slide even if you're in the first row, but the, these are each different cognitive tests each point is an individual, and here each line is an individual's trajectory. And you can see that some cognitive tests really decline whether you look at it cross-sectionally or not. So uh, uh, here's, for example, a, 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 a wordless learning task declining over time, uh, perceptual speed, working memory. And similarly, you can see uh, that in general, these decline over time. There's variance. Some people don't change very much, but in general, there's decline over time. But in other tests, this is word knowledge, what we probably call semantic knowledge, semantic memory, uh, or you could even think of it as vocabulary in a, sort of a, in a way. Uh, you see, this really doesn't change much at all. So again, um, uh, when you dissect these things, you find that some things change and some things don't. So what I'm going to talk today is about how cognitive change can be looked at in terms of what you might think of as large-scale neural networks. And I'm going to talk about two networks in particular that have different anatomy, different function, uh, and different susceptibility. So one of these you can think of as a sort of prefrontal cortex, corticostriatal, thalamic, dopamine-based network. Uh, and this, of course, is just a schematic that underlies working memory. So I'm going to talk a bit about working memory studies. I'm going to talk about some of the network uh, 
uh, data from functional MR and talk about some of the PET data we use to measure dopamine. And another network is an episodic memory kind of network that tends to involve uh, the parietal lobes, medial temporal lobes, uh, and is related to the deposition of this brain amyloid protein uh, that uh, Mona mentioned in her introduction, also involves a separate network that is generally referred to as the default mode network. So I'm going to talk about these in turn and start with uh, this dopamine uh, network. So it's been known for, for, um, for quite a while now that dopamine plays a key role in uh, all kinds of cognitive functions, but especially in working memory. And this is sort of the archetype um, uh, example of a, of, a, of a monkey working memory uh, uh, experiment where the animal basically uh, sees a cue, uh, has a delay period, and then has to make a response by saccading uh, his eyes to where the cue was. So that during this dis delay period, there's actually no behavior, there's no overt behavior, but the animal has essentially encoded the location of that cue uh, and has to maintain it during that delay period. And it turns out that uh, this delay period is exquisitely sensitive to manipulations of the dopamine, dopamine system and by uh, either ablating it uh, anatomically or by using pharmacologic approaches, one can change the neural responses and the behavior uh, very dramatically. And there's a very large literature on dopamine and working memory that uh, I'm really not going to uh, go into. So there's two ways that you can think of dopamine's involvement in working memory. And one of them was, is related to this direct involvement of dopaminergic fibers that innervate prefrontal cortex. And these are generally referred to as the mesolimbic and mesocortical system. Uh, they're projections from the midbrain, uh, ventral tegmental area particularly, uh, and directly supply prefrontal cortex with dopamine. And again, um, uh, this is a system that's subject to experiment in, in a number of different ways. As it turns out, we can't actually image it very well with our PET techniques. We can't see dopamine very well in the prefrontal cortex. So we've become interested in looking at the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia, of course, are innervated by the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, by the, um, substantia, by the uh, 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 substantia nigra. And the basal ganglia, in turn, uh, participate in a series of loops that um, essentially uh, influence prefrontal cortex uh, through uh, uh, striatothalamocortical projections. And so we've been interested in trying to understand how changes in dopamine, basal ganglia, uh, dopamine in the basal ganglia might affect prefrontal cortex, working memory, and so forth. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, so again, forgive me for spending time on methods, but one of the techniques I'm going to talk a lot about is PET scanning or positron emission tomography. And the basic principle behind PET <coughs> excuse me, is actually pretty simple. You inject a, a, a person or an animal with a radioactive compound that emits a positron. And that positron uh, travels a very short distance in the tissue and it hits an electron and it produces two photons that travel in uh, uh, exactly 180 degree opposite directions. And so you put an array of crystal detectors around the individual's head and when two crystal detectors are simultaneously excited, you know that a positron was emitted along that line. And by taking this in three dimensions, you can essentially reconstruct an image through a bunch of different algorithms that can be as simple as just projecting these lines on top of one another uh, or back projection. So um, this is essentially the, 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 the instrumentation and the physics part of PET. The actually interesting part uh, comes from what you put this positron emitting atom onto. So theoretically, you can put it onto anything uh, if you can make it. Uh, and, but it's not that simple because you have to be able to make the compound, inject it safely, and track its metabolism, track its physiology, track its pharmacokinetics. But if you can do all that and come up with a model for how this tracer is working, you can map a whole variety of biochemical processes in the brain relatively non-invasively. And uh, the only issue here really is radiation exposure, and in general, it's, it's really quite low. So we've been looking at the dopamine system. And again, forgive me if, you're, if you work in this field, this is probably pretty obvious to you. Uh, one of the um, traditional ways of looking at the dopamine system with PET is with a ligand called fluoridopa. So this is L-dopa. It's the same compound that uh, we give to pa patients with Parkinson's disease, only in this case it's labeled with fluorine 18, which is a positron emitter. And that traces an, a relatively late step in dopamine synthesis, which is aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. So L-dopa essentially tells us 
how much dopamine this presynaptic neuron could be making if it were supplied with the optimal amount of substrate. But there's some problems with uh, fluoridopa, and I'm not really going to go into them in great detail, but suffice it to say that while it is a substrate for AADC, it's also a substrate for one of the metabolic enzymes in the pathway, a catechol o methyltransferase So the image is actually kind of noisy, a little difficult to, to quantitate. And I, I, again, you probably don't care about this very much, but, um, but I do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we actually use this other uh, radial ligand called fluorometatyrosine, which is also a substrate uh, for um, uh, AADC, but it's not metabolized by COMT. So actually, you know, even if you've really never seen a PET scan before, you can see that the FMT image has a lot more contrast in it, and that's because there's no noise in the background of the image, there's no uh, uh, metabolites in the image, and what you're seeing uh, is essentially a very uh, a higher uh, spatial, better spatial resolution and better contrast uh, and better pharmacokinetics of this AADC enzyme. So we've used fluorometatyrosine basically to map dopamine synthesis capacity in, in people. And uh, this is just an example of what a PET scan looks like. Uh, actually, the data looks like you inject it into a person, and essentially what you're seeing is that this is, uh, this is for the fluorometatyrosine tracer. Uh, what you're essentially seeing, actually, I'm going to come around here so I see it too. Uh, is, the, uh, is the uptake of this tracer in the brain, and it's essentially trapped. And we can use a bunch of simple metabolic uh, uh, kinetic models that allow us to quantitate this. And what you see here is a quantitative image of dopamine synthesis capacity just superimposed on an individual uh, subject's uh, MRI scan. Okay, so one more uh, method slide, and then I think we're done. So the other technique that we've been using is looking at resting state functional connectivity, which, I, again, probably some people in this room are very familiar with. But the idea here is that we don't actually ask the individual to do a task while they're in the magnet. Uh, I, I know you're familiar with the concept that usually we're comparing individuals' um, uh, uh, bold signal or fMRI signal at different states of, of cognitive activity. Here we just put them in the scanner and tell them not to do anything. And we look at spontaneous uh, fluctuations in the MRI signal after filtering it for a number of, uh, of, a number of, of uh, things we're not interested in. We get uh, frequencies that are, that are actually quite slow. They're at like 0.1 hertz. Uh, and what turns out to be quite interesting is that there are correlations between uh, voxels in the brain or between different regions in the brain. And so here's an example uh, where you might say put a seed uh, in this region, select a group of voxels in prefrontal cortex, select a group of voxels in, pre in parietal cortex, and then simply look at the resting state uh, activity in these voxels and derive a correlation map of how highly correlated the time series in these voxels are. And here, these are actually time series that are pretty highly correlated, uh, as opposed to these particular uh, two uh, groups of voxels, again, in parietal lobe and this time in visual cortex, and you can see these groups of uh, voxels are not well correlated. So we would say that these two uh, uh, regions are functionally connected, uh, and these two regions are not. Uh, now, there's, a, of course, a lot more to this. There's been a lot of debate about what this signal means. Um, there's a lot of evidence that structural uh, connectivity underlies a lot of this functional connectivity, which you can get both from animal studies but also from uh, uh, tractography in humans. Uh, and so uh, this is a technique we've decided to use for a number of reasons uh, in the lab, not the least of which is it's, it's really not challenging for subjects to do. When you do that, you can pull out a whole bunch of different, different sort of uh, groups of voxels that are connected. And this is a, a nice paper that was published a couple of years ago uh, from this group in Amsterdam that essentially shows uh, groups of correlated voxels here, uh, groups of voxels in the visual cortex, this is the default mode network that I'll talk about a little more later. Uh, these are groups of voxels that tend to be correlated in prefrontal and parietal cortex, uh, motor cortex, and auditory cortex. So these are voxels in which the MR signal is highly, uh, highly correlated. So what we did in, uh, in, in this first study I'm going to tell you about is we actually wanted to look at uh, what kind of network we might find uh, if we uh, uh, used a, a seed in the dorsal caudate and basically said, show us all the voxels in the brain whose time series is correlated with this particular group of voxels in the caudate. And actually, to be fair, we weren't the first to do this. Uh, uh, there have been a couple of other papers doing this, and we actually have pretty much found the same things, which is that when you put a, a region in the left dorsal caudate, 
you actually find, uh, so th these images are reversed, uh, this is the left hemisphere. Uh, you actually find high correlations though in both, in both caudates, but also uh, in, uh, in uh, thalamus, in prefrontal cortex, and actually in parietal cortex as well. So this pulls out a network uh, uh, of voxels that are highly correlated at rest when the individual isn't doing anything. And depending on where exactly you place these voxels in the caudate, you actually end up with a different kind of network and you can pull out networks that are relatively more uh, related to ventral striatum or even more motor, what seem like more motor uh, networks. If you look at putamen, you end up with a motor cortex and so forth. So we did this in 23 healthy young individuals. Uh, and then we wanted to look at how this was related to dopamine function. So what we did is we looked at the functional connectivity between the striatum and the prefrontal cortex. And you can essentially come up with a simple index of how highly correlated the voxels are in those two, uh, in those two basic <coughs> brain regions. And then all of these individuals also underwent PET scanning with this fluorometatyrosine tracer. So we basically said, what's the relationship between the correlation in this particular brain region uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, dopamine synthesis uh, in the same striatal region that we used for the seed? And uh, obviously, I wouldn't be telling you this, this big buildup if we didn't find something. Uh, that it turns out that if you look in the, uh, in the left quad eight, uh, you find that a higher uh, dopamine synthesis is actually associated with tighter connectivity. Uh, between anterior cingulate and striate and, and, the, and the caudate. And the same story is in the right caudate. And in fact, if we use a putaminal seed and pull out the network, we don't find this association with the caudate. So this is suggesting to us that, first of all, that the approach works. Uh, and second of all, that something is happening even in a non-cognitive state where sort of basal levels of dopamine may be tuning this kind of connectivity of this network uh, in some way to make it fu more functionally coherent. Uh, I, I wish I could say more about that, but we're just now starting to investigate how we can manipulate this system and how it might change in age. And so let me tell you a little bit about some of the aging studies that we're getting into. So if you look at the aging brain in terms of the dopamine system, you find a, a, a very uh, convincing um, large number of studies that show change in dopaminergic uh, aspects of the system, uh, all of which are result in lower dopamine function, with one exception that I'll tell you about in a second. So there's been uh, uh, plenty of evidence suggesting that uh, nigral neurons are lost over time. This is over a long period of time, so this is, uh, I can't see the, it, 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 but it's something like uh, five to eight percent per decade, so it's not super fast, but uh, it, it's, it's substantial. Uh, there's loss of the volume of the various striatal components, but here's the caudate uh, uh, over, again, a similar age range. There's loss of dopamine transporters that you can measure in a variety of ways. Uh, with PET scanning, there's also been shown changes in D2 receptors and in the vesicular monoamine transporter, which, is, uh, where the, which transports the uh, uh, synthesized dopamine into the presynaptic vesicle. So these are all pretty substantial losses. They're really I think quite well replicated, and, uh, and this is a very convincing aspect of the dopamine story. Uh, there's, there's argument about whether it's truly linear or not, actually, uh, that it may pick up, uh, get faster later, but, but there's some argument about that. But usually these studies don't have enough data to do really, I mean, you know, these are all postmortem studies, right? So it's, usually they don't have enough data to fit other functions very well. Yeah? Uh, it's normalized to the normal No, I don't, these, these are not, these are not, but if you compare uh, figures for neuronal loss in all kinds of other cortical areas to figures for neuronal loss, for example, in the striatum, they're much higher in the striatum using, using most stereological techniques. I mean, so it's not normalized, but if you look at similar techniques, you know, in, in other cortic in cortical regions, it's higher here than it is in cortical regions. <clears throat> um, so anyway, this is pretty convincing, but what's, what's interesting actually is when you look at dopamine synthesis, and that's what, remember, we measure with our PET studies, the story isn't as coherent. Uh, so uh, one postmortem study showed actually a very small age effect on aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. There's a bunch of PET studies that actually, using fluoridopa that I mentioned, that actually show no effective age. 
And there's a couple of studies in Parkinson's disease now, again using PET, that suggest that AADC, the synthetic enzyme, is upregulated early on in Parkinson's disease. And in fact, that's what Kish suggested in this particular paper, that, that, that maybe to compensate for the amount of loss of presynaptic terminals uh, and uh, postsynaptic receptors and, 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 and so forth, there was actually an upregulation in dopamine synthesis. And again, I think, I think there's evidence in Parkinson's disease that this may be happening. So we um, actually decided to look at this, and uh, we, we collected a, a fairly large group of uh, older and younger subjects, uh, fairly large for these kinds of studies. Actually, it was about uh, 25 older people and about 15 younger people. <clears throat> and what you can see here very simply is that the older individuals actually had, <coughs> excuse me, higher signal from FMT in both the caudate and the putamen than the younger individuals. And when you look at this graph against age, you see that actually there was an increase uh, in, these, uh, in, in this uh, uh, decarboxylase activity as individuals got older. Now, this may seem counterintuitive, and um, maybe, maybe it is, and maybe even it's wrong, but um, one of the things that I want to stress about this is we don't mean to say that older people necessarily make more dopamine than younger people do. What we mean to say is that their AADC enzyme activity is juiced up, essentially. And we actually think that this is probably an indication of a dysfunctional dopamine system, that is probably an indication of a system that's trying to compensate somehow uh, by by synthesizing dopamine on the presynaptic side. It doesn't mean the signal is going to be tr transduced the same way with the same kind of D2 receptors. Uh, and it doesn't mean that their dopamine function is necessarily more or certainly not better. But this is a finding that actually sort of echoes through the next study that I'm going to tell you about. <clears throat> so, um, so this is a, 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 a sort of a complicated study, but I'll make it simple because we took the individuals uh, who we had measured dopamine in, uh, dopamine synthesis, with FMT, and we studied them with a working memory task. So that's how I got started on this, on this story, talking about changes in cognition. There are substantial changes in working memory with aging. And in this particular uh, example, we used a task called the Sternberg, uh, and these individuals did this while they were in uh, a magnet. So this isn't resting state uh, fMRI. This is actually cognitive activation MRI. This is a uh, a well-known cognitive experiment where individuals lying in the scanner look at a screen and they see an array of letters and that array can be varied from two to four to six. There's a delay period and then they're, then they're uh, uh, shown a probe letter and uh, during that probe uh, they have to respond as to whether or not that probe was in the previous set of letters or not in the array. So this is a working memory task just like that monkey working memory test I task I showed you. And during the delay period, uh, that's the part of the period that is should be particularly susceptible to effects of dopamine because that's what we know about the monkey physiology. So <clears throat> these individuals basically did this task um, and we ended up seeing a wide array of activations and for a number of reasons, uh, mostly the fact that we had previously seen an association between dopamine and brain activity uh, in this particular brain region in, in a previous experiment, we decided to look at this particular brain region as, again, a seed to look at functional connectivity, only this time to look at functional connectivity during the actual task. So we took all the individuals in the study, uh, we took their most active voxels here, essentially uh, the 10 most active voxels, used this as a seed region, and then ended up with this as essentially a region where we did a similar kind of um, experiment, and we said, now, now tell us the, the, the voxels that are correlated temporally uh, with activity in this particular seed region during the encoding phase of the task, the delay phase of the task, and the response phase of the task. And when we did that, you can see here that actually, I'm not showing you the seed region, I'm just showing you the regions that are correlated with the seed. There's high correlate, there's, there's, a, there's an a area of correlation in the caudate and the young individuals during encoding, delay, and response. But when you average across all, all the individuals in the study, you actually don't see it very well in the, old and, uh, in the old subjects during the encoding and the delay. You do see it during the response. So 
just looking at these images, you can see that the correlations between prefrontal cortex and striatum seem to be falling off in older people. And this is just the same data plotted graphically, again, with the extent of connectivity here. This is actually the number of voxels that show a significant uh, correlation. But you see uh, the young individuals here, the older individuals here, uh, much lower connectivity to that prefrontal cortex region. But here's the interesting part. Here's, here is the uh, PET measure of dopamine synthesis capacity on the x-axis. And here's the connectivity again uh, on the y-axis. And you can see that as, as dopamine synthesis went up, again, what we are hypothesizing to be a, a, a non-optimal dopamine system, as the dopamine, uh, uh, dopamine synthesis capacity went up, the actual connectivity in this network is declining. And when you take it the third step and looked at connectivity uh, uh, and associate it with task accuracy, you actually see that higher connectivity uh, is associated with better accuracy on the task as well. So it's a, a story that is suggesting that changes in dopamine are affecting this system during a task that are leading to dis that's leading to disconnection and changes in behavior. And since there's these changes in the dopamine system with age that we know about, this seems to be a, a pretty reasonable uh, set of findings. Uh, and we're currently actually working at ways to sort of follow this up with a bunch of other techniques that I'll um, be glad to talk about if we have time at the end. So for low, low connectivity, the better you do? The, no, I'm sorry. The lower connectivity, the worse you do. No. That's accuracy. That's connectivity. So that's higher connectivity. But I'm speaking about dopamine. Uh, so the, the higher the dopamine, there were weak associations between dopamine and accuracy. Actually, they were pretty weak. Okay, so it should be negative. Yeah, it should be negative. But you know, uh, as you'll see when we start talking about the amyloid, it's sometimes hard to relate the biochemistry to behavior because there's things in between that I think are mediating them. That, that's what, that's what I, it's much clearer in the next set of experiments. But, but you're right, it should be negative. Yeah? Uh, um, there is a difference between men and women. Do, do, do you know in your sample? Uh, the women? In general, there's a difference. Uh, yeah. we, we, we did, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I, I can't honestly remember. Well, if there was a difference, I'd remember it. So, uh, so I, either we looked and we didn't find a difference. Uh, I'm sure we looked at it. Or, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure we looked and we didn't find it. Because I'm pretty sure I'd remember that. Yeah. Yeah. In the connectivity, uh, as, as, as it seems, uh, you lose the continu continu continuity because you take a few points of each event. Is it, is it uh, the way you do it? Uh, it's event-related design, but you have multiple you have multiple events. Uh, I'm yeah, but for the encoding of the other other parts, so each you take few points and then few points for the next event and then yep. the next event. So the the points are not a, a continuous point. No, but the trials are jittered. Right, so they're happening at different times of the hemodynamic response. Is that is that? So, what? I mean, so it, one of the things I, I saw that yeah. in the in connectivity is that the, the way the function look, and here you need to maintain uh, if, if the function is the most important thing, not the average signal. Yeah. Then uh, it seems to be a, could be a problematic because it's uh, not continuous. Okay, so I'm, maybe maybe I, maybe I didn't explain it, the, the the actually the analysis clearly enough because actually it's not the same. You probably know this, but it's not the same analysis as we do for the bold, where we're looking at the time series connectivity. We're looking at the beta weights, so we're looking at the correlations of the beta weights in each voxel. So I'm I'm not sure that's such an issue. Do you, may, It's measuring the degree to which the voxels are, are yeah, I mean, I, I would think so. <laughs> it's measuring the degree to which the voxels are essentially being activated. These are the number of voxels in each of these regions. These are the, these are the brain regions that are simultaneously activated during the, this event part of the task. So it's the, it's the simultaneous activation. I, I'm sorry, actually, uh, that's a good, I didn't really explain that clearly. We, 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 I didn't even mention that, and I, I realized I should. We looked at encoding, delay, and retrieval, and we actually didn't see these effects in anything but the delay period of the task. We didn't see these dopamine effects in anything but the delay period of the task. That, that's an important point. And what's the explanation? 
Well, I, I, I mean, the explanation is that I think whatever whatever's happening in this frontostriatal system is dopamine sensitive during the delay period of the task because the, the neurons, well, I mean, the, the characteristic explanation is that dopamine is tuning the neurons to maintain the representation during the delay period, during the delay period. But that's post hoc, that's not a prediction you had. Big no, actually, the prediction was that we would see this during the delay period. Yeah, absolutely was. Yeah, that's why we did an event-related design. Okay, so um, I'm going to totally switch gears now and tell you about another series of experiments using same kind of methods. But this one is related to the other system, this sort of memory system, this amyloid system, uh, uh, amyloid sensitive system. And let me just give you a little bit of background, which is that in Alzheimer's disease, the, um, the, the, the key neuropathology is uh, essentially marked by this amyloid plaques, the senile plaques or neuritic plaques that are composed of this protein called A-beta, uh, and also these tangles, these neurofibrillary tangles that are composed of this protein called tau. So this amyloid has become sort of the central, uh, one of the, the central dogmas of Alzheimer's disease, and it's sort of based on a whole lot of evidence, but the, uh, the dogma is that this amyloid deposition uh, is uh, a proximate cause of Alzheimer's disease. So uh, a lot of the evidence comes from genetic studies which show that, um, uh, so this A-beta protein is produced by cleavage of a much larger amyloid precursor protein, and mutations in the amyloid precursor protein close to the sites of this cleavage uh, all cause Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and mutations in uh, presenilin 1, which is one of the part of one of the cleavage enzymes, also cause Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and essentially, uh, all of the autosomal dominant causes are associated with uh, altered processing of this APP and increased production of A-beta. And the fourth main genetic cause of Alzheimer's disease, or association at least, is an APO lipoprotein E. Uh, if you have the E4 allele, you have an increased risk of Alzheimer's. That's also associated with increased deposition of A-beta. It's a much longer story than this, but um, in essence, uh, there's uh, an a, a major hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease that altered, either altered production or altered clearance of this A-beta protein uh, leads to uh, a cascade of neuronal dysfunction, uh, synaptic failure, and the cognitive symptoms uh, of Alzheimer's disease. So people have been looking for signs of Alzheimer's disease in the Alzheimer brain uh, for many years, and one of the techniques that people have used is uh, PET scanning again, and this is an example of a, a group of subjects studied with PET scans of glucose metabolism, or FDG. Uh, and these are Alzheimer's patients compared to normal older people. These purple areas are areas of the brain that are hypometabolic or reduced in function. Uh, and this has kind of been the metabolic signature of Alzheimer's disease. And I'm going to come back to this pattern again, but let me just tell you that parts of it, especially these areas in the parietal and, medial temporal, uh, and middle temporal cortex and the precuneus, also show up when you look at the, some of these resting state networks uh, <coughs> in what's been called the default mode network. Uh, an interesting thing is that if you look at people with genetic risks, you can find uh, evidence for this abnormal metabolic pattern. So this was a very nice study that was done by uh, Eric Ryman, who's at Arizona, uh, who um, uh, actually studied people with this E4 risk for Alzheimer's disease, and people who are homozygous for this allele showed metabolic alterations in the same parts of the brain that patients with Alzheimer's disease did. And these were individuals who were, on average, 10 or 15 years before they were, would have symptoms. They were completely healthy individuals who, who didn't have symptoms. So there's plenty of evidence that something is going on in the brains of people uh, who are cognitively normal uh, based on genetic factors and another, a bunch of other, uh, a bunch of other kinds of risk factors for dementia or Alzheimer's disease. But this whole field really kind of broke open about four years ago, or five years ago, when uh, two uh, investigators at the University of Pitts, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, uh, Chet Mathis and Bill Klunk, actually developed a way to image these amyloid plaques in the brain. So what you see here is a, uh, is a drawing of a molecule called thioflavin T, which is a, a histologic stain that shows up in the postmortem specimens it's, uh, and binds to the amyloid. And they really worked on this project for a long time, but ultimately uh, came up with this molecule that uh, has been nicknamed Pittsburgh Compound B, or PIB for short. 
and it's labeled with carbon-11, which is a positron emitter, so you can inject it into the individual, uh, map its distribution in the brain, and essentially quantify the amount of this A-beta or beta amyloid that's in living people. And just as a parenthesis, it only shows us amyloid that's in the fibrillar form, that's aggregated, and there's a, quite a debate as to whether or not that is the most important form of amyloid or not. It may be uh, that more soluble forms are more important, but this is, this is all we have at this point. But it's, it's really been a very interesting uh, approach, and a number of, I, I think there's now probably uh, at least 30 or 40 labs around the world that are using this. So if you look at, at again, age, you find that um, uh, if, you, if you look at the proportion of pe the people whose brains would be characterized as looking like Alzheimer's disease, <laughs> This is something that goes up with age. So what we're talking about here are individuals who either have post-mortem findings of plaques and tangles in their brains that look just like Alzheimer's disease, or else have evidence of amyloid in the brain on PIB scans. So just to sort of point this out, at the, between the ages of 80 and 85, about 30% of people have enough amyloid in the brain that if a pathologist looked at the brain, or if I looked at the PIB scan, I'd say that person has Alzheimer's disease. Yet they're cognitively normal. We know. We know they're cognitively normal because they're tested. And some of these post-mortem studies are very nicely done where individuals are tested in a relatively short time before their brain is, uh, is autopsied uh, and they're cognitively normal. So having lots of amyloid plaques is compatible uh, with being cognitively normal. So I guess the first interpretation of this data is that amyloid has nothing to do with Alzheimer's disease. Um, but I, and it, that certainly is a, a, a good interpretation. But another interpretation is that individuals are able to somehow uh, resist the effects of this amyloid, or there are subtle effects of this amyloid that, that are going on that we should be able to detect. And I think those are two sides of the same coin. The, one of the questions we're interested in is why some people have this amyloid in their brain are cognitively normal, and why others uh, have the same amount of amyloid in the brain and are demented. <clears throat> So just as an example, here's a very nice study that just came out uh, from the group at Washington University showing the relationship between Abe, age, I'm sorry, and PIB binding in the brain. And you can see that this goes up with age, but it really goes up dramatically if the individual has a copy of that ApoE4 gene. So one of the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease is associated with having more PIB uptake in the brain. And uh, that's also just shown here. Again, Eric Ryman did this study again, uh, showing that if you uh, have one copy of the E4, you have more amyloid in your brain than if you have no copies. And if you have two copies of E4, again, the color intensity indicating PIB binding, if you have two copies of E4, you have still more. So uh, ApoE is a, a known risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. It's also associated with, with PIB binding. Now, one of the questions, of course, that we're all interested in is these people who are cognitively normal who have this much amyloid in the brain, we can now follow them and see what happens to them over time. So on a clinical level, uh, this is really going to be an important tool to see if these people actually develop Alzheimer's disease or not. No results of that yet? Because the first paper was 15 years ago. No, I'm so, uh, no it was uh, 2004 was the first paper. Uh, the first paper of PIB uh, was 2004. Did, did, did I say that? There was an earlier slide that looked to me like Oh, yeah, well, I, if I did, I, I did. No, no, it was, uh, the first paper was 2004. There are, some, um, there, are some, there are some papers that are coming out in the last few months that are suggestive that individuals who have more PIB in their brain are declining. But it's still kind of early. Really, we're, still, we're dealing with pretty small, small numbers. But uh, we'll, we'll be seeing it in a few years, for sure. So this is just some data from, from our lab, just to show you, you know, what it looks like quantitatively. Um, so we, we, used a, a, a sort of, we used an approach where we iteratively removed individuals to try to decide what was a positive or a negative scan. There's really no, we really shouldn't be looking at these scans as positive or negative, because as you can see from the data, they occur on a continuum. But these are individuals who we, who we classified as having high PIB, these are low PIB, and these are, these are borderline. But I just want to show you, there, these are numerical values for average total PIB uptake in the brain, uh, really throughout the cortex. It's almost entirely in the cortex. And I just wanted to show it to you to compare it to Alzheimer's disease, because there are, there are plenty of these healthy uh, older people who, in my lab, are tested extensively, who have just as much PIB in their brain as a patient with Alzheimer's disease, and they're cognitively intact. So there's, there's just no doubt about that. And this is just examples of what these can look like. Um, this is, uh, you know, 
probably our highest control. And this is one of our, these are some of our higher Alzheimer's patients. And you can see, you couldn't look at the scans and tell them apart. And that's a, that, there, are, there, there aren't some people who don't seem to decline with age. So hopefully we're all part of that group. Uh, but th this is a, someone who doesn't have any amyloid in their brain. So <clears throat> I think it was Randy Buckner, maybe Mark Rakel, uh, but certainly one or both of them pointed out uh, in the mid-2000s that the pattern of uh, changes in um, atrophy, glucose metabolism, and now uh, PIB deposition with amyloid uh, really reflects the, this uh, resting state functional network that we've called the default mode or default mode network. And so this is an example of this default mode network. I'll come back to it in a second. Uh, this is where the amyloid is deposited. This is where brain atrophy tends to occur. These are metabolic changes. And of course, this overlaps uh, with parts of the brain that are active during memory tasks. The default mode network is probably defined. Uh, you can certainly define it by these resting states. Uh, because it's a network that essentially uh, comes out when one seeds the precuneus or parts of retrosplenial cortex. Um, it's, you essentially get these resting state temporal correlations. These are also brain regions that tend to be deactivated uh, when people are doing cognitive tasks and more activated during a baseline state uh, of, a, uh, of, a, uh, uh, of a cognitive task, like a, watching a fixation point. So they tend to be turned off during most tasks, except with the prominent exclusion of many memory tasks. So this has been said to be a a network that's involved in the brain's resting state, an idling state, when, when, when essentially uh, uh, you're not cognitively engaged. But there's actually a lot of debate about that. We could, we could certainly have that. So I just want to point out that that is a really interesting paradigm for degenerative disease. And um, the idea that this default mode activity parallels this amyloid deposition has sort of been now taken up. And there was this very nice paper in Neuron by Bill Seeley, who's at UC San Francisco, who actually <clears throat> looked at the patterns of atrophy in a group of degenerative diseases. So this is Alzheimer's. Uh, this is a behavioral frontotemporal dementia, semantic dementia, progressive non-fluent aphasia, and corticobasal syndrome. These are all degenerative brain syndromes. And what he uh, did is he actually, uh, he actually uh, was able to use um, a, a at structural MRI to define these changes uh, in, these, um, uh, in, in, in atrophy that were common across individuals with these particular degenerations. Again, so this is correlation across voxels, but this is structural correlation. So in other words, in Alzheimer's disease, if voxels in this part of the brain tended to shrink, they tended to shrink in this part of the brain as well. He came up with multiple networks <clears throat> that were different across these different diseases. And when he went to controls, essentially, he was able to find these same intrinsic networks in both this resting state bold. So again, by seeding this particular area uh, in the resting state fMRI, he got these same kind of networks. If he seeded uh, this parietal area, he was able to pull out the default mode network. Uh, if he seeded this anterior temporal uh, area, he pulled out this, so the, the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> this, uh, this frontal type of network and so on. And so in other words, these networks that degenerate uh, in these different diseases uh, uh, are reflected by resting state networks in function and actually also structural networks, the same kind of procedure where you would, where you would essentially see the brain region and looked at brain regions within normals that are, that are correlated in terms of their size. So this suggests that, that these degenerative diseases are actually network diseases and have this sort of, we, we know that there's this pattern of regional vulnerability in a lot of these diseases. Uh, and this suggests that some underlying reason for this may be their functional and structural connectivity. Uh, so this is, shows you the early forays into this default mode network in, um, uh, in aging and Alzheimer's disease. And I'm sort of running low, I guess. I have until six, maybe. Is that right? Yeah. All right, I'm fine. Then. Uh, <clears throat> this essentially shows you the default mode network in older individuals, in Alzheimer's patients. This is, uh, this is resting state uh, fMRI, one of the early studies in, uh, to apply to a clinical population. And this is a contrast map that just shows you that this connectivity in this network is beginning to fail in patients with Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> so here's data from our lab showing the overlap uh, between PIB and this resting bold network. So in uh, yellow, you see the, uh, the actual network that's 
essentially uh, comes out of the resting state data. Uh, in the blue, you see the, the, the PIB distribution, and it certainly is not a one-to-one -one correlation with this network. But in the red, you see areas where essentially the network uh, and PIB uh, overlap. And there's substantial areas, especially uh, in precuneus, parietal lobe, you, and uh, uh, in medial parietal lobe, and in retrosplenial cortex, uh, and uh, prefrontal cortex, medial and lateral uh, as well, and around the angular gyrus. Again, these reflect a su substantial extent, not, not perfectly, these areas of hypometabolism that one sees also. So we actually were interested in looking at this in terms of how, did this, how are these correlated with changes in the resting bold. And so what we did was we started by just looking at uh, whether this network connectivity is affected uh, by the amount of amyloid in the brain. And to make a long story short, there are areas in the brain here shown in blue where higher global amyloid, again this is amyloid throughout the whole brain, is associated with reduced functional connectivity. But then there's areas in the brain where more amyloid there was, there was greater functional connectivity. So again, these are, these are voxels that are defined as having more correlation with the rest of the network in general. So, so more or less connectivity with the rest of this network. So we can begin to see signs that this amyloid deposition is associated with changes in this network. Uh, it's hard to interpret increased functional connectivity uh, or decrease for that matter, but let me go to that in a second. So when we actually looked at these particular uh, amyloid deposition in these different networks, um, it, actually the amount of amyloid in different nodes of this network is not the same everywhere. So it's a little complicated because every other, every other bar is an Alzheimer's disease, but let me focus on the normal older individuals. So uh, here's the global PIB, which is what we correlated with this network in the normals and in the Alzheimer's. Uh, here's PIB in the precuneus, uh, and it, you can see it's pretty high. And in fact, if you look across most labs, this is where we tend to see the most amyloid in normal older individuals, uh, particularly in the precuneus. Uh, and it's relatively low, actually, in the medial prefrontal cortex, which is this area where we saw this increased connectivity. And it's kind of intermediate in retrosplenial cortex. Uh, and you can see that, again, it, it overlaps with the Alzheimer's patients. So then we said, okay, we have these relationships between global PIB, how much amyloid there is in the whole brain, and sort of the, the, this network. What about regional relationships? So in other words, very simple, put it simply, if you have more PIB in your precuneus, is your precuneus more disconnected, right? And the short answer here again is, the answer is no. When we looked anywhere in these blue regions, we didn't see a local relationship. So this kind of suggests that this is, this is a network. This is something that's happening at the level of the whole amount of amyloid in the brain and the function of this network globally. It's not something that's occurring simply because this node of the network is becoming disconnected because you have amyloid in it. And in fact, we didn't even detect changes in, this, in these nodes in glucose metabolism uh, as well. It's, it's sort of a network. We didn't detect regional changes. We only detect changes when we look at this network level. It's actually a little different when we looked in prefrontal cortex and in this brain region, the more amyloid that there was, the higher the connectivity again. And that's just the example here. If you look simply within the medial prefrontal cortex, you actually saw an increase in, in, in connectivity. So, uh, you know, we, we are trying to decide whether this is some kind of compensatory process uh, or another possibility is that it's spontaneous cortical activity that's that says that synchronous, the um, uh, very interesting paper came out from uh, Leonard Mookie's lab a couple of years ago showing that actually, uh, if you look at spontaneous activity in transgenic mice, uh, you actually saw evidence of spiking uh, and correlated discharges. Uh, and so there's been this uh, recent suggestion that A beta or amyloid actually could be potentially excitotoxic, but uh, we really don't. Uh, we really don't know what this means at this point, and we're, again, trying to understand uh, what the relationships are between these changes and cognition, and that will certainly help us understand whether this is compensatory or, or deleterious, but we don't know that yet. So just the last point, that the same network that we picked out, we pick out um, functionally is, is there structurally. So if you just look at uh, 
how much amyloid is in the brain versus what the, what the amount of gray matter is in the brain, you find that the more amyloid in the brain, uh, the more atrophy there is in the hippocampus. And this has been now seen in a, in a number of different uh, labs. And we know the hippocampus is involved fairly early in Alzheimer's disease. And when you do the same analysis and sort of look at the hippocampus and seed it, you actually pull out this network of brain regions structurally that are correlated. Uh, and again, it looks very much, if, especially if you look at the sagittal, but you can see it here in the lateral prefrontal cortex, parietal cortex, uh, and the medial parietal cortex, and the precuneus. These are brain regions that tend to uh, be correlated with this hippocampal volume. And so again, there's evidence, again, in cognitively normal individuals that this whole uh, system is structurally being altered, uh, even though people are able to maintain cognitive function. So whether it, uh, whether it turns out that this is an early uh, sign of Alzheimer's disease, again, we have to wait. To see. So, um, oh, sorry, last, my, just very last slide, I guess, is that what we looked at this uh, a while ago, it begins to explain how come we don't find good correlations between amyloid and behavior. So this is the amount of, this was uh, one of our first studies where we, we had a relatively small number of studies. When you looked at the amount of amyloid in the brain and correlated it with hippocampal volume, there was actually a pretty good correlation. When you looked at the amount of amyloid in the brain and correlated it with memory, there actually wasn't much of a correlation at all. And in fact, when you look across laboratories, most people are not finding much of a relationship between how much amyloid there is in the brain and what people's cognitive function is like. Memory, memory is bad or not. But again, within our data, when we looked at hippocampal volume, there was an association with memory. So this, this gets to the point of, why don't we see an association between the biochemistry and the cognition? Well, we think it's because the biochemistry is changing something downstream, in this case, something in the hippocampus that's then driving the cognitive effect. And so we just looked at this in a pr fairly simple statistical model. Uh, and essentially, what, what you uh, see here is, um, this is the uh, relationship between PIB and episodic memory, and this is what happens to that relationship when you add hippocampal volume. That is, PIB, the effect of PIB goes away. Uh, but this is, the, uh, the, in, in the solid line, the uh, relationship between hippocampal volume and episodic memory, and when you add PIB to that, it really doesn't change the effect. So this is suggesting that changes in the hippocampus are mediating the effect of PIB on, on the downstream changes in memory. And I think as we've study this more and more, we're finding all kinds of structural and functional measures that are associated with changes in amyloid deposition that have better associations with cognition than the amyloid itself. So when we talk about why do some people maintain cognitive function in the face of amyloid and others don't, we're beginning to believe this is due to what kind of downstream effects the amyloid is provoking, and it may be network changes that are going to be important, it may be structural changes, it may be changes in glucose metabolism, but something is happening downstream from the amyloid to actually be associated with the cognitive dysfunction, and we still have to try to understand why some people seem to be uh, relatively susceptible to this and others not so much. So just sort of to summarize, um, we can identify these resting state and activity related networks with functional MR. Uh, there's evidence that changes in these frontostriatal networks are related to dopamine and working memory and what an F, I don't know what that is. Uh, and that this frontoparietal connectivity, which is part of this default mode network, is related to changes in, uh, to deposition of beta amyloid. Um, these may mediate some aspects of age related cognitive decline, and I think there's evidence of neurochemical con Meredith Brasky and Susan Landau postdocs, and the amyloid work was done by a, uh, a grad student, Beth Mormino, Gil Rabinovich, who's a young faculty member at UCSF and in my lab, and Kwame Oh, who's a postdoc. So um, oh, that's my lab, and uh, those are the people who let me do this. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a big story with the cholinergic system and Alzheimer's disease, as I'm sure you know. And, um, you know, the only drugs we have for Alzheimer's disease work on the cholinergic system. I think there's been a sort of a revisionist history, a revisionist view of what's happening with the cholinergic system, which is that it used to be <coughs> described as one of the fundamental lesions underlying the amnesia. And it may be, but I think people are thinking more that it's a fundamental 
lesion underlying attention and uh, control rather than amnesia. There's evidence actually that this system is upregulated in people early in Alzheimer's disease, so there's evidence of sort of swollen uh, um, uh, uh, basal forebrain neurons that are actually, that may be producing more acetylcholine. Uh, but um, I think the problem with the cholinergic story in Alzheimer's disease is really simply that it just hasn't led to an effective treatment because the drugs really don't do very much. But what about imaging? Yeah, so some people, uh, so, so people have tried to use, so actually that's a, a, an interesting question. I mean, people have tried to use imaging to look at the effects of drugs uh, that might be therapeutic, and it hasn't been a very good story. There have definitely been changes. Uh, there have been so a whole lot of very nice work on the cholinergic <laughs> system, for example, and how it might tune neurons in the visual system, for example. Uh, and people have given cholinergic drugs and done fMRI experiments uh, using the so-called pharmaco MRI and shows that it actually can change uh, sort of receptive fields and tune neurons in, in visual cortex. Um, you know, there have been studies in aging uh, that have shown changes, but I, I guess I sort of have to say they've not been consistent. Uh, they haven't led to anything, you know, really consistent. When you use the word connectivity, yeah. uh, which is based on correlation of activity into different areas, is the implication that these areas send axons to one another or that they're driven by a common source? It's, it's completely unclear. In some cases, we know the pathways. So, uh, there, for example, one of the connectivities, so, so in some cases we know the pathways are, are axonal. For example, retrosplenial cortex to hippocampus, there's a lot of evidence of, of, of sort of co-activation of those regions and of resting state correlations in those regions and so forth. And there's, and in fact, we can actually see differences in, depending on which part of the retrosplenial cortex you look based on what we know about connectivity of the hippocampus. So in that case, it, we think it may be following a simple axonal connections, but there's no, I don't think you have to assume that for all of these cases by any means at all. There's no reason, this, this, these data don't, don't tell you one way or the other. They simply tell you they're activated together or they're correlated at rest together. Is there an uh, effort to try and look and visualize the lipid composition under, I mean, in correlation to, to, to the amyloid? Is this like the NMR stories you're talking about? That um, mostly on in vitro. In vitro. Yeah. yeah so, um, so people. I, uh, the reason I asked is because there are, are people who've tried to use NMR, NMR spectroscopy, spectroscopic imaging, yeah. to look at various peaks in the MR signal that might be related to different uh, different um, well, lipids. Yeah, but in, in vivo, uh, no, that's the only way I think people have tried to do it uh, in, in humans uh, with, is with NMR. And I, again, I have to say that I don't think the story there has been very consistent with NMR. But that's a very difficult technique to use. It's very difficult to make these measurements in living humans. NMR spectroscopy, for example, suffers from really poor signal to noise. And so um, it's been very hard to, to, to make those measures, I think, in, in, in people. So there was something Yeah. So, so first of all, the default system is. It, this is generally true if you act if you average over multiple cognitive tasks. You see this sort of deactivation in in the system. But the system is clear is brought online in some cognitive tasks. So, particularly mem memory kinds of tasks, it is turned on. But I think you know. I, let's assume that it's always turned off. I mean, I think uh, it, it's still. Uh, I mean, the question is. Well, but I mean, you know, resting state bold tells you one picture of one kind of thing that this system is doing, right? And I don't think you can infer from that that simply because either during resting state bold these things are correlated or because you average over many cognitive tasks, they're correlated during onactive conditions that this... So, so the, it's hard to believe that the brain would produce a system that's totally irrelevant to behavior. Let me put it that way. Well, I, I'm not sure anyone planned where to put it, but I mean, 
Uh, w w one possibility is that the reason it's in the default mode network is that this is a system. So uh, it's an interesting. It, so there's an interesting story that actually neuronal activity leads to secretion of this A beta protein. So neurons that are actually stimulated in vitro secrete more A beta. So if this is a system that's very active a lot of the time, right, it may simply be an unlucky group of neurons that are very active when you're not doing anything. And it's secreting more of this A beta. And it may be the reason that there's this whole literature on cognitive activity protecting you from Alzheimer's disease. You know, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a questionable literature, but there's a substantial number of studies that suggest people who remain cognitively engaged during life have a lower risk of Alzheimer's. Maybe their default mode is turned off more. So, I mean, I don't think it's a teleological explanation at all, right? And, but uh, but I, think there's, I think there's reasons that it makes sense that it's there. I have a biochemically based question. In, in our hands, the, the thioflavin T detects better folds in proteins. And it doesn't really matter which protein. So how well was the specificity of the people yeah. controlled? Yeah, so it's, it's true that, um, you know, it's sad but true that we don't exactly know the target of this ligand. Uh, but it is probably something in the beta conformation. Uh, 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 and, but uh, there have been actually a number of very nice studies now that show that so the, we, have the, we have the relatively low sensitivity of PET scanning working for us. When I say relatively low, it's probably the highest sensitivity technique that's available, but it's low compared to what you have in tissue. And it turns out that PIB does bind to a whole variety of beta sheets. It binds to neurofibrillary tangles, it will bind to the prion protein, it'll bind to alpha synuclein, but it binds to them at actually substantially lower concentrations uh, that, so that you're really very unlikely to be detecting them, to detecting them. You're probably not even detecting them. The only exception, that the only other kind of amyloid it binds to in high in, in relatively high concentrations that probably show up in PIB scans is the amyloid in the uh, blood vessels, amyloid angiopathy. Mm -hmm. so, you pro so, so those signals are a mix of plaque amyloid and vessel amyloid. In animals, does PIB match amyloid deposition? It's a funny question because it's... Um, uh, so, so this is really an interesting question. You don't know... It's a long answer. Uh, the, uh, in transgenic animals, the short answer is basically yes. You know, so I mean, and the, animals don't really get amyloid. I mean, uh, th there haven't been any. Uh, yeah, there's a monkey model and there's a dog model that actually spontaneously have uh, a, this A beta, but it actually occurs at pretty low rate. It really hasn't been seen in any PIB scans. But if you look at transgenic mice, transgenic animals, yeah, you, this stuff binds to that. But it binds quite quite differently. Uh, and with, it, with the PIB test. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. So 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 actually. Since you're pushing me, I'll give you the long answer. Because uh, it's really an interesting answer. Um, so you have to make the PIB at very high specific activity. In other words, very little cold compound when you study a transgenic animal. Because it turns out that there are no, probably not as many binding sites for, the, for, for PIB in the transgenic amyloid as they are in the patient amyloid. In fact, the first studies that were done with PIB in the transgenic mice were, mouse were negative. They didn't show any binding. And it turns out that if you make it in high specific activity, it'll bind. And if you do it using other kinds of uh, uh, labels where you can inject a ton of, of, of this stuff into the animal, like uh, uh, um, two-photon microscopy, and you can see it, yeah, it, it, it binds like crazy. But it's probably got uh, to do with fewer binding sites. And that may have to do with the fact that these plaques the plaque production in these transgenics is just driven. You know, these are dual mutation animals that are pumping out tons of this amyloid. And so this amyloid is probably being driven by a different kind of biophysical process than it is in a human. It's just happening so fast that I think it, confirmation is actually a little different. Its binding sites are a little different. It's really a very interesting story, actually. Okay. So if there are no more questions.